on the show today, Mimi Kuo Dima. So Mimi uh, is a yoga teacher, a Qigong teacher. She founded, I believe, the first uh, yoga school in uh, in Beijing called Yoga Yard. She's a famous person for Tri Yoga. Uh, her YouTube channel has millions and millions of hits teaching Qigong and yoga. So I've had a lesson with her, which I very much enjoyed. Mimi, welcome. Oh, thanks, Mark. It's great to be on the show. So tell us a little bit about your story. How did you get interested in the body? Oh, uh, my mother. <laughs> it always goes back to the mother. Okay, okay. <laughs> tell me about your mother. I feel like I should have an Austrian yeah, accent for this. What happened? Was she, what was she into? Yoga, qigong, what was the deal? Well, she was into yoga. She did yoga when she was pregnant. She had a, uh, a book from the 70s that she gave me when I was flailing around in Beijing, not very healthy, stressed, uh, really suffering. Um, but I got into the body actually before that, and it was my mother as well. Um, and that was when I was born. I had turned in toes uh, and really kind of weak knees, weak immune system generally. But she thought, because I had pigeon toe that, uh, feet, that if I was sent to ballet school, that would be <laughs> it's the opposite for ballet, isn't it? It's take, if you see me on my phone, I forgot to say I always take notes on my phone during these. So if anyone on YouTube is thinking, why is Mark so rude? He's texting. I'm not. I'm taking notes. Um, so she sent you ballet school. All right. In, and in, was this, tell us, in China? Tell us the geography here. This is in the UK. In China, where? I was born in upstate New York. Upstate New York. Okay. So you're in upstate New York. You'd be, you're three years old and you get sent to ballet school. Well, I should be clear. Actually, I was four because we'd moved to Arizona and that's when she put me into ballet school. Uh, I was not very good. I was, I was uncomfortable in the tutu. They, uh, <laughs> they didn't progress me very far. I didn't progress myself very far. Um, by the time I was in junior high, uh, I, I, I took an interest in dance. Uh, by the time I was in high school, I auditioned for the Prima Donnas, which was the modern dance troupe of University High in Tucson, Arizona. That's where we lived by then. Um, and I was never very good. <laughs> I, still, I still liked it a lot. I was um, uh, trying my best, but you know, I pursued jazz, ballet, um, modern, continued with ballet in, uh, just for technique when I was in college. And then again, it was my mother <laughs> when I was living in China, kind of backtracking to where we, we started off. She gave me this book from the 70s. It was a photocopied book. Uh, I had a woman in a, a frumpy looking unitard doing some yoga, and she thought this would be good for me. So I took this photocopied book and I started doing some of the movements in it. And uh, it, immediately I felt some sort of shift and I was... Uh, really, I, I had digestive issues, I had uh, asthma, I had um, general high levels of stress. I was, I was living in China as a, I was working as a, a photojournalist at the time. Um, I had stomach ulcers that were caused by all kinds of things going wrong at the hospital. Uh, so when I started doing the practices, uh, I, I felt embodied for the first time. Um, mm -hmm quite a long time. Uh, that took me to, you know, getting more interested in, in movement again. And I neglected my body for many, many years. So getting back into my body was kind of this uh, watershed. Um, you know, by 90, I guess 97, I left Beijing for a while and I moved back to the States. And when I was in New York working, I started doing some yoga classes at a local kind of community center in Brooklyn, loved it, kept it going and just at home. And by uh, the year 2000, I'd gone back to Beijing, gone back to California, ended up in Los Angeles where one of my best friends lives in, um, in Santa Monica and Venice. She took me to her yoga teacher in, uh, at the time he was teaching at Yoga Works and this was in 2000. It was just as the big boom of yoga was beginning. And I was going through a difficult relationship. I, uh, again, had been kind of neglecting my body. Um, and in the first five minutes of that class, I was, I was in tears. You know, it just released something really deep in me. And I was there every, every other day, pretty much. 
<laughs> after that class. The yoga works, big boom happening, lots of great teachers around that place and that time. So who were the big influences on you? I, th- I think I know at least one of them. Eric Schiffman. Yeah. Eric Schiffman. Yeah, I had a little exchange with him. He seemed like a great guy. I was kind of sad we couldn't get him for the conference because he seemed such a cool guy. I really just liked his vibe when we, when we had a little exchange of messages. He's wonderful. He's, he, yeah. Uh, so Eric Schiffman was a big influence, influence. Donna Farhi later on. She's my main mentor uh, and teacher and friend. Um, and... Later, I, I met Matthew Cohen, who was also teaching in Los Angeles around that time. He was uh, one of the first teachers at Sacred, uh, uh, Sacred Movement, which was a school founded by Max Strom and where Eric Schiffman taught, Sheila Ray, uh, Saul David Ray, Sarah Powers, all these kind of names. They're rock stars. These are the, the, They're the yoga celebrities of today. All yoga celebrities existed, yeah? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But the, um, <clears throat> the classes I took with Matthew were, were powerful because he introduced me to Qigong and he was blending Qigong, yoga, Tai Chi, uh, lots of different kind of movement principles. Uh, yeah. We by then had a yoga studio in Beijing. I invited him there to teach. So you kept the Chinese connections. So that wasn't just a job. There was the, you kept some sort of business connections out there. Do you have family out there? I'm trying to so understand the geography here. <laughs> so I, I, you know, I go, I, I went back and forth for a uh-huh. year. Uh, I spent a total of about 13 years in Beijing. And in between some of the stays there, uh, I came back to the U.S. to work and do things. But um, in 2002, I opened the yoga st- uh, studio called yoga yard it's still running it's still going it survived the pandemic it's huge now i spoke to a chinese friend just two days ago and she told she'd literally just come from china and she told me that yeah it's huge in china now yeah yeah it's huge um and so matthew trained some of our first teachers at yoga yard he was a real big influence um he's still someone i you know hold dear to my heart and he and i have uh, gone on to actually co-teach uh, some stuff we did some retreats and things like that over the last few years together which have gone really well uh, and he sparked this interest in qigong which since 2002 has grown in my kind of interest and as i get older i think it's shifted significantly more towards qigong for me um, i still love yoga but i don't i don't practice it as much anymore so the question uh, i'd have for you really here is what and i i'm similar journey by the way i find myself more drawn this is why i reached out to you originally was just to get some lessons i someone i found that recommended and i'd heard of your teacher and someone said oh you know you should talk to me me we've got a mutual couple of friends i you know i found myself so I got a bit older go okay maybe qigong is kind of appealing to me what was it that you maybe weren't getting from yoga or the appeal to you to make you say okay i want to take up this whole other practice and be a beginner again and you know it's not necessarily an easy path so what 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 how did that happen well, it was such a gradual evolution since 2002. It's been woven into my asana practice and it's been kind of there right alongside my asana practice and often thrown in with it. And the first time when I, I did Qigong with Matthew, uh, I stood and just Tadasana, you know, but it was the, the Qigong version of it, Wuji. And my hands started getting super hot. Uh, I felt more grounded and connected to kind of a steadiness and an internal stillness than I had in all the yoga that I'd done. Um, I I also felt the flow of energy. And and when I say that, it's energy. People say, well, do you believe in energy? I don't believe in energy. What is energy? It can't be conceptually described. It has to be felt. And there was a sensation there that was in some way evocative, powerful, whatever you want to call it, you felt something. Yeah, yeah. and so uh, that drew me to it immediately. The, the softness, the fluidity, that drew me to it. I, um, as I got more interested in it, I studied with teachers who shared five element theory, five phases, and Chinese medicine, uh, that drew me in even more. It shifted my my health. Uh, I was 
fairly benefited from yoga in you know huge capacity and then certain things about my energy level my digestion my uh sort of chronic asthma thing that was going on all of these things were directly impacted by me starting qigong understanding as well sort of the 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 theories behind qigong was another level for me um adding on to kind of how I, how I structure my days, depending on the time of day and what activity I was doing, depending on the, the season and what was uh, the energy of the season. Uh, all of this got me more interested in Taoism, which is the kind of, you know, the, the foundation of these ideas. And as soon as, as soon as I jumped into the Taoist ship, I was set sailing. I just, <laughs> it's got a way of putting you in, huh? Yeah, wave after wave after wave, I'm just there. And it's just so attractive on so many levels to me in ways philosophically that I, I, I hit dead ends with, with yoga. Mm. Um, Buddhism and, and Taoism have a lot more overlap for me. Uh-huh. Uh, so, on, on, so to answer your question, you know, mm. what was a shift? It was so gradual. Mm-hmm. Um, I think now, particularly since the lockdown, I've had time to decide where I want to put my focus. So mm. I'm not traveling into London. I'm like many people home. Where uh, are you based now? Oxfordshire. In, Oxford, um, nice. yeah, okay. Northwest Oxfordshire. Big garden. It's been a beautiful you know, spring, summer. And I decided, well, I want to be practicing three hours a day, doing all the things I want to do. Uh, I also want to, take up an opportunity where maybe I can study with these teachers that I started studying with Beijing in Beijing, Mm -hmm. another teacher, young style Tai Chi teacher in London. And I said, can we do it via Zoom? Mm -hmm. And they agreed. And that's just catapulted my my studies. Great, it's quite an opportunity, yeah. And everything that I'm I'm drawn to do right now is (laughs) internal martial arts. (laughs) Yeah, for me, there was a journal of subtlety. Like I started jumping around, beating people up. And then I thought, well, maybe I could jump around without beating people up. And then I thought, maybe I could jump around a bit less. And then I thought, well, maybe I could just move and not jump and not have to do press-ups and chatterangas. And, and, and then, you know, now as I'm going, I'm not only 40 now, but I'm still going, you know, I'm, it's, more, it's not that I'm physically incapable of doing the jumping around. It just sort of bores me a bit. And what interests me more is the subtle layers mm. and the sort of subtleties and the feeling and the nuance and it's difficult to get the nuance at a thousand miles an hour in hot yoga or hard style martial arts the nuance is lost with the muscularity you know and uh, maybe it's possible to combine but that my interest has got more and more and you see the same thing with any art like if you're into food right people start off crude and then they normally get, you know, oh, it's a subtle wine testing. I have gone French for this part of the interview. You know, they, they, they get more and more refined. French accent. Yeah, and they end up speaking in French accent. No one knows what happened, you know. But it, it's, um, just see what I mean? That there's this journey to refinement and subtlety that not everyone, you don't hear of many people who start off with Tai Chi and end up with um, Koko Shinkai Karate. It tends, do you know what I mean? It tends, and sometimes people just think, oh, you're getting old and lazy and fat and tired and knackered. But I don't think it's just that because I'm actually in reasonable shape still. But um, this this sort of interest gets more refined. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, and I also, I think there's something about the uh, the age and the energy of yin and yang shifting. When mm-hmm. we're young, we have a lot more yang energy that's just in our mm-hmm. nature. We're, we're growing and we're expanding and we're exploring. And our body needs to move more. And as as we get older, the, the yang starts to shift more towards yin. Mm-hmm. And we look a little bit more into the subtlety and the refinement yeah. and the slowing down the meditative qualities and the, the nourishing qualities, the nourishing life. I think yeah. this is important as well. When, like, when young people come to me and say, hey, should I study a martial art? I'm like, yeah, go to taekwondo and kick someone in the head and go to jiu-jitsu and choke someone out. And then but if they're 20, I say that. Yeah. And if they're 40, I might say, well, I got a systema and there's health practices and you can, you know, it's a bit more chilled now. Do you know what I mean? I feel like we should, should be aware that life change and other factors if influence that choice, right? It doesn't have to be at the same time of life. Everything is perfect for us. And, and that's, a, that's a really difficult concept for a lot of people in anywhere in the world, but I think particularly in Europe and America where there's such an emphasis on exercising to feel younger. Right. Right. And, and 
it seems to me that there's what Taoism is good at is appreciating cycles and flow. Yeah. And it, it just respects where you're at. And there's a, there's a deep respect for aging. Uh-huh. Unlike less, you know, in Tai Chi, Matthew Cohen was who kind of prompted this idea. He said, practice and train for 10 years older than you are. That's interesting. So you're sort of preparing for the age you're moving into yeah. and trying to go 10 years back, which I think is the normal thing in yoga. I see people jumping around. There's a, a sort of a desperation to it sometimes. You know what I mean? Like, got to keep, got to keep that 30, 30 year old body. It's like <laughs> you're not 30 anymore. You're 40, yeah. you're 50. Like, like, yeah, I mean, you know, at being a yoga teacher can add a bit of shelf life kind of thing, but it is, it's, there's a sort of, there's an, a lack of acceptance of the aging process. Sometimes I see. Mm, yeah, I would agree. And I think it's, uh, it, it's possible within yoga. Absolutely. And it's reflected in, within the yoga traditions of people who are exploring it and not seeing it as a fixed system. It, it, it's uh, the evolution of the yoga practice and the evolution of the way in which we can understand yoga and kind of take it out of the context that it's been shoved into for whatever reasons as this practice of you know, strong asana and, uh, you know, dynamic, fast practice. Uh, You know, there is a beautiful subtlety and depth to it. Um, But I think especially modern postural asana yoga, it's, it's young. We're still still unsure about what that tree is going to look like. So I I think there's, um, there's some great teachers out there exploring the direction that it can go in and, uh, reaching yeah, evolve so uh, this this is another thing that's very Taoist is appreciating context more generally isn't it like because mm-hmm. it might I know students who practice in different part of their cycle as women in different practices or seasons should we be doing the same practice in the depths of winter as the height of summer like probably not right and yet there's a way in which I see people looking for constancy like I just want to get the right formula of Wim Hof breathing and then followed by 30 minutes of, you know, Iyengar I- I- yoga. And it's like that formula is never going to work because you, like COVID life shifted yeah. or aging, or have you got kids or, you know, what's your work doing right now? Like my work goes in seasons of certain times a year, you know, we've got this big conference coming up. That's totally changing my practice. Cause I just got a lot less time, you know, like we have to understand context, I think to practice intelligently. Absolutely. I also think that with, uh, Taoism, there's, you know, Zhuangzi, who was one of the ancient Taoist sages, he was really fond of animals because he said animals, they are in, in tune and in touch with their innate nature. You know, they're not trying to be anything other than they are. <clears throat> Whereas human beings, I think we, we forget our innate nature and we forget our connection to this, the seasonality and the, the energies. And you look at, I look at my cats and they're very different in the summer than they are in the winter. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and most animals are. You don't have to tell them, right? You don't have, they don't have to look at their calendar and go, oh. We it's don't write it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, it's this, right. this is the blessing and the curse of the, the limbic uh, and the frontal cortex, right? right. <laughs> the frontal cortex can override the limbic and everything else. And, you know. uh-huh. Uh-huh.